guys welcome once more to our youtube channel for those of you who are taking physics on thursday gc 2023 session we wish you all the best uh bu go rocket so let's have a quick look at northwest mark 2021 as part of your revision process okay let's go so guys this is question two again you pause the video you check it out right notice here that the examiner has given you the directions of current already so it tells you that all right this is i3 here this is i2 here this is i1 all of them are entering this node x so yeah be careful there okay okay determine the currents i1 i2 and i3 in the circuit below now um from kachov's current law of course all these currents i2 i1 all of them are entering this node so we just sum all of them to be equal to zero since there's no current that's leaving the node right so sum of all the currents entering a particular node should be equal to all the currents that are leaving no currents leaving so zero that's our equation one there from kochov's current law okay now let's apply voltage law loop one we're traversing the way i've indicated you see that good so we're now going to say now let's sum up the emfs first so if i'm traversing like this negative is positive this guy is positive i go like that i traverse like this negative is positive this guy is positive too so you have nine plus twelve there now let's get the emf um the pds uh, if i'm traversing like this i'm traversing the direction of current across this resistor so that is positive then i2 if i traverse like this remember that i3 is going upwards so i'm traversing against i3 so that's negative six i3 right there we can simplify this to make sure that the equation reads 21 equals 10 i2 minus 6 i3 that's our equation two now perfect now let's go ahead and apply Kirchhoff's rotation law to loop two this is our loop two let's traverse again like that so notice that our emf sources will be how they add up so negative to positive that's positive so this is a positive emf source but when i traverse down towards this nine volt notice I'm, I'm moving from positive to negative so this guy is negative here okay so we have 15 minus 9 right there be equal to what be equal to okay now notice i1 is the current that flows to this 4 ohm resistor i1 flows to this 4 ohm resistor so you notice that uh if i'm traversing the direction of i1 this voltage is positive for i1 okay if I go down here, notice that this voltage here is negative. So I get negative 10 I2. Okay. So there, and then we simplify that equation and we get equation 3 right there. <clears throat> now, uh, we can put 1 in 3. Now, guys, there's a trick here. If you look at the two equations you get from Kirchhoff's voltage law, equation 2 and equation 3, there's always, and it does not matter which question it is you're solving, if it is this one or any other Kirchhoff's voltage problem you see in advanced level. You look at the two equations that you produce from Kirchhoff's voltage law, there's always one value of current that is repeated for both. Now, look at this, this is I2. Look at this, this is I2. It is repeated for both. Whatever you're doing, don't touch I2, okay? Never touch I2. So we can replace I1 or we can replace I3 in equation two or in equation three. So, <clears throat> so we have to look for what to replace, right? And then now make that thing the subject here and then put it in the other equation. Good. So putting one in three, <clears throat> you notice that, all right, so in three here, what I'm going to touch is I1. So what is my I1? My I1 is a negation of I2 and I3. So when I put it in three, I'll get equation four, which gives me what? negative three to be equal to seven I2 plus I2 I3. I notice that now my equation four is only in terms of what? I2 and I3 because I've replaced I1 originally in the equation three, okay? So yeah, you can you can process that yourself and then you also see that that's equation four. So we can solve now simultaneously. This is now maths, right? Two and four, we can solve them simultaneously. Why? Because again, they have the same unknowns. I2, I2, I3, I3. So solve simultaneously, you notice that we have 12 to be equal to 31. I2, I2 is 0 0.4 amperes. So we can put I2 in equation three, right? To get I1, which is 2.5 amperes. And then what is our I2? Uh, Okay, or put I2 in equation 2, we get I3 as negative 2.9 amperes. Perfect. So, uh, the examiner says B, comment on the value of I2 and I3. Well, I2 is positive indicating the current flows as indicated on the diagram, as the examiner has indicated now. So, you notice that your I2 here is positive. So, you tell the examiner, all right, I2 actually flows in the direction indicated on the diagram. But I3, notice that it's negative here. So, the examiner got this direction wrong. Okay, so I3 flows opposite to the direction indicated on the diagram. All right, perfect. So that is it. And then we can go on and then talk about C. Find the PD between X and Y. Okay, so we can apply some nice things there. This equation, let's just talk about how it came about. 
So this is Vx here, the PD at x, okay? The potential at x is Vx. So we are traversing down this path. If I'm traversing down this path, I'm going to get Vx. Now, there's a PD drop here, okay? And I'm traversing in the against the direction of the current. So this PD here is positive. When I'm adding it up together with the EMFs, so I get Vx plus 10i2 here because that's the PD that is dropped here. Now I'm traversing downwards. I move from positive to negative. This guy is negative now, so I have negative 9 there. All of that should be equal to the PD at the other end. Y, so that's Vy at the other end, okay? So you now realize that, okay, so we can get Vy minus Vx. So carry Vx that way. You have 10i2 minus 9. So you have 10i2, put i2 there is 0 0.4, multiply by 10, you have 4. 4 minus 9 gives us negative 5. So Vy minus Vx is negative 5. And Vy minus Vx is basically Vyx, okay? That's a PD. Um, that's a potential difference between y and x, so you call that vyx, okay? So that's negative 5 volts. So what does this tell you? It tells you that, hey, if vy minus vx is negative, it means vx is, or x at a higher potential. So vx is higher than vy. So x at a higher potential compared to y, okay? Okay, so the first thing you need to learn is that it's not straight y. First, the unit we are calling it of right hand side right so f base units of f should be equal to base units of every one of these things okay so but what is base unit what are b the base unit of f well base units of f since it's force per unit length you will get the base unit of ma for force divided by l right so what is force kilogram meters per second squared divided by meters that give us kilogram per second squared so those are base units of the left hand side now let's go on and evaluate the base unit of the right hand side uh mu i1 i2 over 2 pi r and the real work here will be to get the base unit of mu, right? The base unit of mu will be equal to the base unit of 1 over epsilon c squared, okay? This is this is, this is is a very famous equation in higher levels of physics. How do I get the speed of light? Well, it's basically 1 over the square root of the permeability of free space multiplied by the permittivity of free space, okay? So it's from there that I've gotten this equation, all right? So you can always use this in A-levels, okay? Base unit of... Uh, our mu now becomes what one over. Now we get c squared here, but what is the base? What are the base units of epsilon? Well, you can use Coulomb's force equation. Okay, f equals q squared four pi epsilon r squared. So to make epsilon the subject, f will take the place of epsilon. So that's why you you see me putting that. So get the base unit here. So we get uh, that if I get one all over c squared q squared over four pi f r squared. Notice that this denominator here goes up to become the numerator, right? So we now have force times r squared which is kilogram metas metas per second squared multiplied by meta squared which gives us kilogram metas cubed per second squared okay so those are the base units of this thing divided by c squared of course meta squared per second squared uh cure here is it okay which is ampere squared second squared good so those are our base units of mu kilogram metas per second squared per ampere squared now, uh, we can get go ahead and then completely get the base units of the right hand side, which is now um, mu's base units multiplied by ampere squared, right? Because I1, I2, they have the same base units divided by the base unit of R, which is just M. So you realize that if you put those there, you get ampere squared here divided by M. So that gives us what kilogram second per second squared. Again, these units of left hand side equals units of right hand side. Equation is homogeneous. You've proven, guys. Uh, so the next part says, uh, a physical equation is homogeneous and the student concludes that the equation is correct. Explain whether or not the student is right. Okay, first thing you do to the examiner is that you tell the examiner that the student is first of all wrong. Be very clear, okay? So tell the examiner the student is wrong. Good. Since homogeneity is not a sufficient condition for correctness, as it cannot, so you, not, you go ahead to explain that, all right, you cannot test left out portions of the physical equation, test the presence of dimensionless constants or the absence of dimensionless constants, investigate exponential logarithmic trigonometric functions and so on and so forth uh c says give an example of a dimensionless physical quantity well there are so many refractive index efficiency power power factor not power power factor okay uh so yeah that's pretty much it for question one guys so your six marks dangling right into your pocket right here 
So let's move on to question two.